This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Silvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. Five fans, four fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is January 2nd, 2023. Jonathan Osborne here. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Happy New Year, Luke. Happy New Year, Jonathan. I really think we're turning a new leaf. We're washing our hands. For our YouTube viewers, you can see me washing my hands of this three-game losing streak. And now the Magic will, as you are quite literally washing your hands with a bottle of water, the Magic are not losing in this in the year 2023. That includes the start of next season. We're just not losing again. We're not a losing team. We we had that six game winning streak. It wasn't a fluke. And now we just get to we just get to continue to have just this long, never ending winning streak. I don't know about all that. I do mm-hmm. know that our listeners are in for a special treat today. We were joined later in the episode by Kobe Price, the Orlando Magic beat writer for the Orlando Sentinel. And we didn't want to spend too much time talking about the you know three game losing streak the Magic are currently on. Um, or the other night against the Wizards when we had like five guys playing and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, if you guys remember, coming up this Saturday when the Magic are on the road against the Golden State Warriors, we are going to be at the Porch South Orange. I guess it's also referred to as Porch Soto. I saw that on the flyer that the Magic put out about the watch party. I don't know where I don't know where the Port Soto name is coming from. I'm sure that is an Orlando thing that I'm just not privy to. But we're going to be there Saturday, January 7th, starting at 8 o'clock. They're located at 4757 South Orange Avenue. Again, to watch the Magic take on the Golden State Warriors. The first three watch parties of the year have all been electric and a lot of fun. So I promise you guys are going to want to come out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Again, the Port South Orange. January Saturday, uh, January 7th is a Saturday, 8 o'clock, 4757 South Orange Avenue. And then don't forget, folks, all-star voting for your favorite Orlando Magic players. You can go to vote.nba.com or you can go into the NBA app. And don't forget your three for one days, uh, January 1st, as we're recording this, New Year's Day was one of them. I hope you voted today. And then January 6th, 13th, 16th, and 20th. Really quickly, Luke, I just wanted to bring up the fact for those folks on YouTube. You see, I'm not in my typical Orlando Magic attire. I'm rocking the number eight, my New York football giants, Daniel Jones. Never gave up on him. Always believed in him. Now we're in the playoffs. Had the game of his life today. His his performance, he's my starting quarterback in my fantasy football Super Bowl championship. He is bringing my team to the playoffs. He's bringing my fantasy team to a championship. It feels good for the first time in six years. The Giants are back in the playoffs, Luke. I know you don't have like a real NFL team allegiance, but I know that you care about me. You care about your good buddy, Brandon, both Giants Mm -hmm. fans. Mm -hmm. It's a good day to be a Giants fan. Yeah, I'm happy for you guys. You know, it's it's been a little bit of time since you've seen success. And uh, I know it is. It's got to be tough, you know, rooting for the, you know, the Magic and the Giants and just the last, you know, decade that it's been. So I'm happy for you guys. I'm hoping, you know, it, I remember when you remember when the Jags went to the AFC Championship, played against Brady a few years back, and it just felt like that was an unprecedented ride for the Jags fans. I was happy for my buddy Ryan at the time who hadn't really gotten to experience something like that in general. And uh, yeah, so I'm happy for you guys. I'll be I'll be rooting. I, I don't have a, an NFL team, but I will I will gladly hop on the Giants bandwagon for the postseason. I know we've got some Jags fans that are listeners. Don't listen for the next 20 seconds because you're going to be offended. Don't compare us to the Jags. I've seen two Super Bowls in my lifetime. All right, that is not even relatively the same thing. It's fair. Wish the Jags all the future success in the world. I think they might even still have a chance to make the playoffs. I don't I don't know uh, how how this week in particular went for them, but yeah, it's been rough for the Giants the last few years. I'm hoping that this success will just carry over to the Orlando Magic. You know, I I believe in the Giants, I believe in the Magic. 
I want them to be competitive for the rest of the season. You know, make the play in, get close to the play in. I know we talked about that with Kobe Price, but um, yeah, I'm definitely celebrating today. And it especially feels good because I'm seeing the narrative really all season long has just been gradually shifting around Daniel Jones. And people are, are realizing that he's good. He might not be like an elite quarterback. Eli Manning wasn't an elite quarterback, That's but he was good enough. And I do believe Daniel Jones is good enough. And I freaking love the kid. And it's awesome. Let's freaking go Giants. Hopefully, uh, you know, we're able to, to win a little playoff game. That'd be pretty cool. But, uh, Luke, that's not why the people are here. They don't want to listen to me talk about the New York Giants. Probably not. They want to listen to us talk about the Orlando Magic. Let's get into the weekly state of the Magic. This week, the Magic went 0-3, bringing them to... <laughs> Luke and I said they were going to go 3-0, and but they went 0-3, <laughs> funny enough. Uh, bringing them to a record of 13-24 and on the season. They have the fifth worst record in the league. They are 13th in the Eastern Conference. Three and a half games back of Chicago now. For the final play-in spot, Toronto has fallen to the 11th seed. The Orlando Magic have an offensive rating on the year of 110.2, which ranks 24th in the league. If you're not familiar with these ratings, uh, offensive rating, that is basically how many points do the Magic score per 100 possessions. So 110.2, 24th in the league. Defensive rating, how many points per 100 possessions do the Magic give up to their opponent? Uh, Their defensive rating is 114.3, which ranks 25th in the league. Their overall net rating is negative 4.1. Basically, what is the Magic score uh, difference between them and their opponent? Over 100 possessions, negative 4.1, which is 26 in the league. Not great. Uh, On the injury front, still without Jonathan Isaac, Jalen Suggs, and Chuma Okeke. The repercussions from the, the debacle in Detroit that we talked about on the last episode, we had to wait pretty long for those suspensions Luke but nonetheless we eventually did get them Killian Hayes was suspended for three games who it was Hamadou Diallo was suspended for one game Mo Wagner was suspended for two games and then man this is a long list it's Cole Anthony it's Mo Bamba Wendell Carter Jr. Gary Harris RJ Hampton I know there's others. Franz Wagner, Admiral uh-huh. Schofield, mm-hmm. Kevon Harris. That's all. That's all of them. So that's what? Nine guys? That doesn't sound right. There was four on Friday, three to seven, eight, I think. Plus Mo Wagner. Well, that's with Mo, I think. Cole, Bamba, right. WCJ, RJ, Gary, Gary, Kevon, Admiral, Franz, eight, and then with Mo, it's nine. So and nine. then the way that it all broke down alphabetically, which I believe we touched on in the last episode. Yeah. It was Cole, Mo, Wendell Carter Jr., RJ Hampton, and Gary Harris were all suspended for the Wizards game. And then Kevon Harris, Admiral Schofield, and Franz Wagner will all be out Wednesday against the Oklahoma City Thunder. Yes. And mix in Mo Wagner serving his three game suspension. So that's to the Wizards game the Thunder game, and then the Memphis game. So Mo Wagner's first game back should be Saturday at Golden State. Because he had two, right? So he's out Friday, he's out Wednesday, and he's back Saturday. Oh, he's out he two, not three. So he's yeah. out Friday, Wednesday, so he'll be back Thursday. Thursday, okay. I wanted gotcha, to talk yeah. to you about this because we, we didn't really talk about it too much, yeah. like even privately. What were your thoughts on like the amount of suspensions and you know, like you know all the other guys that got suspended, but... Like specifically Killian and Mo. Yeah. Um, yeah, as you said, we expected the suspensions for the guys that went out of the vicinity of the bench. That wasn't shocking. Um I think Mo Wagner was just like a it's funny to call him a victim in any sense, but he was a, a victim of what happened after the fact. He was a victim of the aftermath. He does not get two games, in my opinion, if the benches don't clear. Uh, Killian doesn't retaliate. Diallo doesn't escalate. Like if it's just that incident, he gets a game. I don't even know that he would get Maybe. a game. Right, and that's what I was gonna say. Maybe he gets a game, but because of everything that ensued and how he kind of set everything off, none of that happens. Let's be clear: none of that happens without Mo Wagner doing that checking that he did of Killian Hayes. 
None, none of it. So I get it to that effect. Like, you know, you're, you know, Killian, yes, he let his temper get the best of him more, just like his anger anger at the situation. But if there was no situation, we don't even have this conversation. So Mo Wagner, I am a little irritated with you. I'm not going to lie. But at the same time, I think the suspension is excessive consider, considering the, the lethalness of the Killian Hayes retaliation and him getting only one more game than Mo Wagner. So... Yeah, I'm, I don't even have an issue with the fact that Killian got three games. Like some people are like, it should have been five games. It should have been no. ten games. It should have been fifteen games. No, I'm like, three games is is plenty. I think two games would be plenty. Where yes. I have the issue is Mo Wagner getting one less game than Killian. When again, we could argue Mo right. Wagner gets ejected for essentially the second half of that game. Mm-hmm. If Killian, if this happens anywhere else other than the bench, <laughs> yeah. I don't think Mo Varner gets suspended at all. Like no. if this happens at the scores table and like Killian like falls into the scores table or something like that, and the benches don't clear, Mo gets yeah. ejected. Killian gets one or two games for throwing a punch, and that's yeah. that's the end of it. Yeah, if you look at the track record for the NBA in terms of, and I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but if you do did your digging like I did in terms of when someone throws a punch, what happens? You'll see three games is about the max that they give. Most of the time for a punch, I think they might have just like a criteria, just like they do for the benches clearing. That is just like an unstated rule that they usually look at. And I think that Killian just fit the bill for like, oh, it's a classic. Like he threw a punch. Um, some people are saying it's not a punch as well. Uh, I know a lot of Pistons people are saying it wasn't a punch. It was more of a, a shove and they don't think he hit him in the back of the head. That sort of thing. Y'all are, are blind. Are those the same sure. people saying that Mo Varner was knocked out? Yeah, probably, which is yeah. hilarious. Um, Killian but, uh, knocked Mo Wagner out. Oh my gosh! But it wasn't a punch. Uh, Mo was he, the first out person to ever knock another man out with a out. push. Yeah. So yeah. Whatever. whatever. Um. Yeah. So it, you know, whatever. We'll deal with these suspensions and then we're done. Well, let's talk about really the the game that this is going to impact the most. So talking about the Orlando's uh, Orlando Magic's matchup on Friday against the Washington Wizards, the last game of the 2022. Uh, calendar year again Cole Anthony Mo Bamba Wendell Carter Jr. RJ Hampton Gary Harris and Moritz Wagner all suspended for this game the Magic's active roster was Franz Wagner Paolo Bancaro Bull Bull Terrence Ross Markel Fultz Kevon Harris Admiral Schofield Caleb Houston every single guy except Terrence Ross who played almost 24 minutes everybody played at least 26 minutes Franz 37 Paolo 37 Bull played 30 minutes, Kevon almost 30 minutes, Admiral Caleb Houston 27, 28 minutes. I felt like the and again, we're not going to spend too much time talking about this game because as soon as the suspensions came out, where we were like, you're losing on Friday. Like there's no way you're gonna win with eight guys. But I feel like everybody was kind of put in an impossible situation in this game. Jamal Mosley included, like the players. Jamal had a tough task, obviously, managing all of the minutes, figuring out which rotations were going to give the Magic any sort of chance to win. And then from from the player side of things, it's like, all right, if we don't come out with a lot of effort to start this game, we could find ourselves in a big hole and then just not have the manpower to make up the difference. But then the other thing is, well, if we kind of go all out at the beginning, then we're going to be gassed for the, the better part of this game. And then maybe Washington comes out and wins it in the second half. You really just needed to get super hot from behind the arc, which, spoiler alert, did not happen for the Orlando Magic. You had to have a little bit of luck in this game to even be competitive. The Magic were not for the better part of the game. They lose 119 to 100. That's now three straight losses of, I believe, 19 points or more, if I'm not mistaken. I think the Lakers game was 19, Detroit was 20, Washington 19. So, although it's three blowout losses in a row, context is needed defense magic didn't defend well enough they didn't shoot the ball well enough in this game if you don't do either of those things you only have eight guys you're not going to win the game luke yeah um it was just terrible uh (laughs) in general um i think the magic so the first of all the magic got shot attempts the magic shoot the most attempts 
they've shot this season at 100. Shot exactly 100 shots in this game, Jonathan. Second most this season. It's a tie between the Hawks, Clippers, and Boston at 95 field goal attempts. So in those games, man, I mean, in, in this game, you shoot, what, 40, 42%, 42 for 100 from the field, which is oddly satisfying. But you shoot 25 more attempts than the Wizards. 25. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that the Wizards turn the ball over 26 times. Magic only turned the ball over 11 times. But uh, even if you're a low volume three point shooting team like the Magic, you can fall victim to living and dying by the three. The Magic die to the three shooting 18% against the Wizards. Um, missing your free throws more than normal. Dude, there was just so much in this game. It's it's ridiculous that you lose this game by 19. It's also ridiculous that you were once down by 30. But like you said, that we we expected a loss. And I'm not shocked that they ended up losing by 19. It was just the way that it happened. You miss a lot in the paint. It's unfortunate. Uh, we talk about it with Kobe Price, but you're missing bunnies down there. Uh, a lot of the game. Stuff that you normally are hitting. Just really frustrating that, that the Magic couldn't get really anything going, to be honest. They had, obviously, their runs, but the Wizards res- responded, and you're only you're not playing... Yes, you're playing eight guys, which eight-man rotations are not foreign to the league in general. Magic tend to play more than just an eight-game, eight-man rotation, typically nine to ten. But it's just, you know, the personnel. You didn't have a center, which I will say it's still impressive that you score, what, 60 points in the paint without a center. But shows how well these guys can get to the line. But they're just, Philip Rossman-Reich talked about it, and he didn't outright say this, but he basically said it in terms of, the Magic offense is pretty one-dimensional. Um, if you can't shoot threes, your 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 most effective thing is just getting to the free throw line, getting to the paint. I don't know. Guys were forcing things in this game. Paolo, mainly. I mean, whatever. It is what it is. I'm ready to just wash my hands of it and move on. Yeah, looking at the box score, Franz Wagner, 28 points, but 13 of 25. Um, still 52% from the floor, but would have liked to see him get to the free throw line a little bit more. Yep, that's a whole nother conversation, whether or not he deserves more free throw attempts on a nightly basis, which spoiler alert, he does. And then Paolo Bancaro, 21.7 of 24, 29% from the floor, one of five from three, six of seven from the free throw line. He talked about after the game that he's he is in a slump right now. Like he he acknowledges that and he's just got to work through it. We've talked about it, like whether or not he's just kind of hitting the rookie wall at this point. I feel like maybe just given, you know, he missed seven games and we're now 37 games through the way. I think like 30 games is a little bit too soon where you would typically see a guy hit the quote unquote rookie wall. But maybe that's what he's dealing with right now. And it just just keep shooting the ball. I don't think any of us want him to shoot the ball any less. But yeah, like guys just need to make quality looks. When you get quality looks, you got to knock them down, whether they're from the three point line, if you're going to take those or you're getting the rim, just make your shots. But again, we talk about this team needs to defend better. I forget the list that I saw today. Uh, I forget who posted it, but it was basically like since two, the year 2000, all of the NBA champions and where they finished the regular season in terms of offensive and, and defensive rating. There was three teams that finished outside of the top 10 in defensive rating that won the championship in the last 20 something years. It was like the 2018 Warriors. Guess what? Those are not coming around every day. And another one of the teams was like the 2000 Lakers. Unless you got Shaq and Kobe or Steph, Clay, Kevin Durant on your team, you need to be a top 10 defensive team to be competitive if you ever want to win a title. Every single team should just be like, we just need to work on being really good on the defensive end. We'll figure out the offense, especially for this Magic team in particular. I will keep harping on that until I see it because the personnel is too good to not be really, really good defensively. So... Anyways, Luke, I think that is all that we have. Although we did not get a win this week, in the case that we do this week, folks, do not forget the day after every Orlando Magic victory, you can get 50% off your online order from Papa John's with code MAGICWIN. I think now is a perfect time. I'm trying to tie Kobe Price into Papa John's. You get 50% of your normal price with Papa John's with code MAGICWIN. 
And now we are going to throw it to Kobe Price. All right, Orlando Magic fans, we are starting off the new year with a bang. We are joined by none other than Kobe Price, the Orlando Magic beat writer for the Orlando Sentinel. Kobe, happy new year, bro, and uh, late happy birthday. How are you? Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Happy new year to y'all. I'm good. How y'all doing? Been better. Been better. The good. <laughs> it's we're, we're starting the new year fresh. We want to have a, a renewed sense of positivity. We don't want to spend too much time talking about this uh, this game from the other night against the Washington Wizards when the Magic had like six guys dressed. But um, yeah, doing pretty well, Luke. How about you? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, Kobe, what we talked about last episode was, you know, obviously you go through the highs and lows, right? You have the, what, nine game losing streak earlier, and then you bang, go on that six game winning streak. And then you hop on after losing, dropping a few. And Jonathan kind of started off talking about like, do you feel like we're just like too close to the team's success and failures that like, we, we, we don't always see the bigger picture. And, and that definitely like is, is sums it up for us. Like Jonathan talking about like, we've been better because if the magic were to rip off three or four straight, you'd ask us that question and be like, man, we're great. So it's, (laughs) you know what I mean? You just, you live and die with the team success. I know Kobe that, you know, covering the team so closely, it's pretty, pretty similar for you. I would say, would you agree with that? Or is it, are you able to kind of remove how you're doing from the, the work part of it? Uh, I'm, I can be completely honest when the magic win or lose, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm not out here sad, uh, after the losses, yeah. no matter how many there are, I can typically, uh, unless it's like the nine game losing streak that was getting kind of bleak. It's like, Oh shoot. Yeah. Uh, when's the next win going to come? But <laughs> other than that, I'm not, you asked me how I'm doing win or lose down what a three game lose streak. I'm still good. So I envy I'm, you. I'm, I can still <laughs> smile in my day. I'm sorry if that, if that makes you jealous. Uh, but it, doesn't, yeah, no, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. Cause like you, you probably don't also like hit the highs of the wins either. Then I'm guessing like you're, you're one of the, like the players you are trying not to get too high, not trying to get too low. It's a long season. You're trying to pace yourself. Yeah, it's a long. So, and I was talking about this with another beat writer this season, at least to me, feels like it's flying by i don't know why especially compared to last season i guess it's different because i jumped in midway last season compared to being here throughout the full season but the season's flying by like i can't believe that they just finished that was game 37 and we're about to go into game 38 so that's essentially halfway through the season it's like so yeah it's been an adventure but you know Got to ride the highs and lows. I, maybe it's also I expected there to be highs and lows with this season just because of the nature mm. of most young teams. This, this is typically, you know, their experience isn't really atypical. Look at the other, you know, look at look at OKC, look at Houston, look at Detroit. You know, you look at all the other teams that you can kind of compare the Magic to. I mean, it's pretty, there are highs and lows. Yeah. And I think that part of that too comes with like, I didn't personally, I wasn't mentally prepared for a six game winning streak, especially this early in the season. So, so for them to, like I said, you, you go through that losing streak, then you have rip off six straight. And then all of a sudden you think the team has really turned a corner. And then already when the team's kind of beaten down uh, for a couple games, that Detroit game, everything breaks out with Wagner and Killian Hayes. And it's like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Are we going to experience another like nine game losing streak? And it's just, you know, like like Jonathan said, hard to remove ourselves from from the small things and 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 see the bigger picture. But yeah, I think also, I mean, we we're not shy about it. Like we're a fan podcast. This is the team that we do live or die with. I think the people like our listeners do the same. So I, I'm not shocked, Kobe. You're 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 pretty level headed guy. I'm not shocked that you, that you that you're <laughs> able to kind of control expectations. Uh, yeah, I just think when the magic teases like that with a win streak, it's it's a little tough to to come off of that and see the team doing what they're doing now. Yeah, and I was gonna say so, and something else that I guess per, kind of prepared me now. I guess we'll talk about this a little bit more as the episode goes on, but I want I remember when Wendell and Gary both came back, it kind of brought me back to when Markel and Cole first came back. Uh, like, mm-hmm. I, I think they, they got blown. Well, I'm pretty sure it was a blowout in that Hawks game when Markel and Cole came back. Uh, and then I think they play, and then we were talking about this, what, 
off air, I believe they played that game against the Nets where they had what, like eight guys available, nine guys available. Nine. Yeah. Yeah. They had nine guys available and they were competitive in that game. Uh, I think if I'm remembering this correctly, or maybe it was, oh no, I'm wrong. It was the the Cleveland game that Markel and Cole played in. And then they played the Toronto game. And that's where they got blown out. Like we saw them within those games, just like the ups and downs of, you know, that was those were three games of the nine game losing streak where, you know, you just kind of saw the ebbs and flows of like getting guys back and getting guys reacclimated and guys adjusting around that, even though, you know, Gary and Wendell weren't, aren't, you know, ball handlers and are going to control the offense in the same way that Markel and Cole do. I kind of figure it's going to take a minute for this team to readjust to having, you know, their starting big man back who's coming off the bench um, and then just another key contributor in Gary. And um, then, you know, had to readjust alignments and rotations and all this kind of stuff that kind of trickles in just like, oh, shoot, things are just looking different. So I, I figure it's going to be just a period. Now, did I expect for them to get blown out by Detroit and the whole melee that happened there? Absolutely not. But you kind of expect there's going to be – we even saw in the San Antonio game that they wound up winning, like – adjustments happening and that is like oh guys are kind of figuring out how to play with one another again um you know and some guys haven't played that much together like Wendell before Wendell came back uh when he did you know him and Markel haven't really played them played together that much so it's, it's just a lot of that too part of it which I kind of foresaw because I was thinking oh yeah things didn't click into place immediately when Cole and uh when Cole and Markel came back so you kind of have to expect the same for other guys too Kobe, really quick to navigate away from the magic. You talked a minute ago about how last season you you joined, you know, really the beat like halfway through the year. I want to give you props and just give you some flowers really quickly here. You have been absolutely killing it with the one on ones, Wendell, Gary, J.I., Markel. I'm sure there's a couple that I'm missing. You've just been doing such a great job this year. I wanted to give you your, your props and just ask you, what do you feel is like the biggest difference for you in year two as you're continuing to figure out, you know, covering the NBA? Well, one, I, I really do appreciate that. That means a lot, uh, even though I'm trying to, like I say, still stay level-headed, especially throughout the season. It, do, it does mean a lot. Uh, I think the biggest thing is understanding of pacing and the flow. Uh, I think that's... And that's that's something just comes with timing like this or a time rather just doing the job. You understand, all right, this is a good time to work on this story or this is a good time to, you know, pursue this update. This just no like instincts, your instincts kind of take over in terms of when to do certain things, when to do certain features. Like I haven't done many features this year so far, but I'm going to get more into it as the season goes on. Oh, when to do certain analysis pieces, you know, figuring out, looking at the schedule, like, all right, this would be a good time to analyze, you know, these amount of games, this, that, like figuring out those kind of pieces, I feel much more in control or have a better understanding of that compared to last season. Um, that's probably, I would say, one of the bigger adjustments and just being more comfortable, you know, being more comfortable and, you know, a locker room access is open, which has been great for, for me, great for what I do. Uh uh, I do try to give those updates as, I guess, uh, appropriate as possible, especially when guys are out for st- more extended stretches. Uh, I, I'm going to say this now. I see it. Not all of it. I do see the questions about when's X coming back, when's who coming, this person coming back. I see it. And I, the one thing I try to say is I'm not going to withhold that information from you. Like I'm going to report it if I have substantial amount of information, but some of it just also at the appropriate time. Like sometimes there is no update. And that's the update within itself. Like if I ask something about something on January 3rd, there may not be a huge update by January 6th or January 7th, but I try to do it appropriately as things develop. Um, But yeah, that is, like I said, just also comfort too. just comfort, understanding, knowledge, soaking in knowledge just from coaches, players, anybody really. So I want to ask Kobe, when it comes to that, you t- you talk about like you hear who people are kind of clamoring for updates about and you do with that like what you will. Right. You go and sometimes, you know, we've gotten things like what was it, the Cole Anthony update where he said some I think it was like at Thanksgiving or before Thanksgiving or like something like that was the timeline. Right. That we ended up getting from you. Uh, I might be misreporting that. So but you guys already know Cole's back, whatever, doesn't matter. The point <laughs> being about it is, though, like 
I know as far as in the reporting game, like there's a game within a game as far as like the information you get. And like you said, when you feel like it's concrete enough that you're able to report it. I know there's people that basically go off of once I hear the same thing from three different sources, I know it's good to go that I can yeah put it out there. Like I'm comfortable reporting. Like I know everybody has their own philosophy when it comes to reporting in general. Um, is there kind of a complication on, like you said, you're not going to withhold that information. But at the same time, we know the front office is very closed shut. They're not reporting anything. Well, first we're hearing of anything is from you. Is there kind of a a level of, you know, I need to make sure that I check these boxes before I go out here reporting this in the event that like it's not, it ends up not being correct or something like that. And the repercussions from, I don't even know if the magic could present any repercussions. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there is. It's just trying to be accurate. You know, you do have to go through your process in order to be accurate. Um, How that process looks for uh, each reporter may differ, but a lot of it is just, you know, verifying, verifying information is is essentially what you're asking. Um, Yeah. So yeah, I do, I do verify information and sometimes it's not so, and sometimes it's just also depends on how you report it. Right. It's not, I'm saying, you know, I'll bring up the most recent example with Wendell. Right. Um, I didn't report that he was going to come back uh, against the Spurs, at least not originally. I reported that he hoped to come back against the Spurs. Um, And why the distinction of why that matters is. I'm not saying definitively it's going to happen on this day. I'm saying what he hopes to do. Right. And there's a there's a there is a very distinct difference because and obviously this did not happen, but. Wendell told me that he was trying to come back against the Spurs the Sunday game before the Celtics, like that second game before the Magic beat the Celtics in Boston. What if on Tuesday or Wednesday, like I said, did not happen, but what if on Tuesday or Wednesday and when he's going through one of these, um, one of these, uh, these live sessions that he went through to, to ramp up before returning, he got a tweak or something happened or he had a setback and he didn't come back on Friday. Like, and was I wrong? Was I right? Was his hope wrong? No, it wasn't wrong. Like he had a hope, a very, very educated hope based off his own body, based off conversations he had with medical X, Y, Z conversation that I guess even him and I had that I don't always put into the story or fully flesh out in the story. But that's why you also like get into how you were things, right? Like it's not always just like this is happening on this day definitively because it may not be, uh, you may not figure it out until closer down the line if that makes sense like guys may have a target but they understand all right all right maybe this i don't feel great this day what if we try it this day you know i think we kind of saw that i i didn't report on this but when markel came back he was questionable for one game didn't play that game i don't think he played the following i forget the the game how we know (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) it it was a it was a big to do with with (laughs) us internally and uh, conversations we had of, upon uh, Markel being upgraded to questionable, then being ruled out, and then I they said they were he they he was like going to come back in a few games, like against I think it was against the Hawks or something like that. But yeah, so but that just kind of shows you how fluid some of these situations can be, where a guy feels like I'm ready to come back on this day, and he's like, oh, I don't know what with Markel. I don't I haven't even asked what happened. I honestly should have asked like what happened in terms of that. But that just shows you, it's like, all right, I had this day, uh, uh, something, I don't know what happened, X, Y, and Z. Let me try for this day. And that just shows you how fluid it is. So that's why on my end, I try to be careful about not just what I'm reporting, but how it's reported. Because then you get into that, I don't want to call it a game, but just the uncertainty between I report something on Sunday. A million different things can happen between on Sunday when he tells me he's trying to return or the target date to return and Friday. Uh, and that's just one example of a guy. Like there are other different things you try to verify, figure out. You know, you get. We're probably going to get into this with like trade deadline. Like, is this person calling this person, or is they calling the other person? Is this agent contacting this team, or is the team contacting the agent? Like those details. That's why you know sometimes you maybe not you may not uh maybe not leave out of detail you just don't go to the full detail of it because you may not know or you try to verify it and you may it may be uncertain like i know there's a long way to answer but i could ask three different people the same question about which gm called which gm and one gm could say oh i called them or one source would say i called them the other one would say no i called them or they called me and then another person could say well actually 
I was the middle person and I had them all caught. Like, you see what I'm saying? So that's mm-hmm. where you get into like, you had to also parse through those kinds of things too. All that being said, Kobe, uh, do you have any <laughs> updates for us? Any any news that you want to break on the six man show? Uh, no, I don't have uh, any news, any updates to give right now. Unfortunately, uh, I know people are quite really interested in Jonathan Isaac and Jalen Suggs. Uh, yeah, nothing's report, nothing's update. I think I mentioned on Twitter and even one of my stories that Ji he went to Lakeland excuse me, for a practice on December 27th. What I didn't realize on that same day was that he got recalled immediately. So he, I'm just, it just seems like he went to a practice and then uh, on the 27th and then got recalled back to the magic that day. I, I just, I was, that was like the, the first day I was off from my few days off or came back from my few days off. And I didn't think anybody said that. I was like, oh yeah, this is just the thing that happened. J.I. is there and back. So I like good it. to know well, we want it. Getting practicing with Lakeland. Yeah, we want him to continue to to ramp it up, Kobe. So you, you were talking and, and we were talking kind of off air, but you know, you mentioned that you kind of expected some something similar to what we're seeing from this team, just kind of the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs with a young roster. The nine game losing streak, followed by winning eight out of nine, and now we're in the middle of a, a three game losing streak. Heading into the new year. I, I want to say besides health, because everybody knows that this team could use a few more healthy bodies. But what do you think is, is the biggest thing for the Magic to improve on heading into these last 45 games? Oh, man. The, the biggest thing needs to improve on. I mean, I think the cop-out answer is consistency. So I'm not going to try to go with that one. That would help, uh, yeah. Yeah, and not, well, and what I mean by consistency, I mean, it's consistency across the board, uh, like consistency in terms of available bodies, but that goes into health, but consistency in terms of rotations, consistency in terms of performance, effort. Um, I, I think the, if you're talking about maybe like a skill, I mean, I think better, maybe, be, and they've, they've, grown, they've grown in this way. So it's like they've, they've shown growth. I want to see even more growth. Better understanding of of uh, how to not how to protect the paint, but getting out, staying compact, but also being able to get out defensively at the same time. Um, they are a team that prioritizes protecting the paint, um, keeping it you know keeping teams out of the paint as much as possible. And I think we've seen during some of their lulls, you know, sometimes it's a lot of it may be, you know, the other team gets into the paint guys collapse and they're a beat late or a step late or the closeout's not tight. I think that's one of the things that just a better execution of that consistently between, you know, protecting the paint, but also getting out the best you can. You can't, you can't stop everything, but you can at least try to impact. You can try to stop one thing and then impact other things as much as you can. And I think that's just something that they, uh, that I think in this next year, whatever, 2023 will be, something that I'll look to see how they improve at. Well, you mentioned, you know, the essentially just basically being able to balance your defense and not leaning too heavily on protecting the paint or getting out on threes, because obviously in the event that you don't do one of those things, the other is going to happen right. And in abundance, I wanted to, to maybe get your take on this kind of just skid that the magic are on right now, the three game losing streak, the magic were able to, do things that were pretty great uh, in that Wizards game, considering, you know, points in the paint, 62 points in the paint. But they didn't necessarily shoot well in in the paint. And I I believe I was listening to Locked on Magic with Philip Rossman Reich uh, today, actually, and he brought this up where he was like, yes, you're scoring a lot of points in the paint, but you're not doing it. You didn't do it at a good clip. Um, I feel like it was like something like 60% or something like that in the paint against the wizards or 50% or something like to that effect, right? Like on paper, if you were to say that's a field goal percentage, that's different than it being points in the paint points in the paint. Your percentage should be higher than what it was against the wizards. Would you say Kobe that uh, in this skit, it's been things on the offensive end, like not maybe shooting the ball. Well, which is what they did well during that win streak, or has it been on the defensive end? Because you are giving up, you know, 119 to the Wizards, um, giving up just high point totals the last few games as well. Where's kind of the the like where can they 
where should they put more emphasis on to kind of get back on track, I guess? Yeah, I mean, both, honestly, because you, you're, you're pretty lacking in both. But I think if you're asking me, me one or the other, I do think this is more of an offensive issue than defensive. Now, I'm not saying defensively there haven't been issues because there absolutely have. But even during – so even during – the, the streak that they had. I looked this up multiple times. They didn't really, and when I say the streak, I'm really honestly counting from that December 5th loss to the Bucks because they actually played really well in that loss. Um, they played really well defensively through the December 23rd win against the Spurs. They went 8-10 eight, eight and 10 in that span. They didn't shoot it, like, amazingly well. But I think their effective field goal percentage was like 20th in the league during that 10 game span. And their true shooting percentage was average. Uh, and that just helped that it boosts up because they're a team that gets the line a lot. They're decent with the free throws. Like that just helped. So it's not like, but offensively they were seven. So, but it wasn't like they were riding, you know, great shooting. Like they were shooting 36 something percent, 37 percent on threes for the magic. Yes, that is great. But for like, a 10 game stretch and you're talking about you had your best stretch of the season. You expect this to be like 39, 40, 41, um, something along those lines, or you like the high thirties. They were more so mid thirties. So I think for them, better shooting overall will help. But I think what's sometimes what you saw, even especially against that wizard in that wizards loss was they would miss at the rim. And that's an easy transition opportunity for the Wizards. Or they get blocked, and that's an easy transition. And then they got they're kind of scrambled. Or honestly, they're a little deflated because you know, let's be honest, they missed some bunnies in that game. They missed some bunnies where if you get the bucket, now the Wizards have to face a set defense. You're able to get things together. But instead of that, you know, they're you're they're they're running off. They're on, they're on the races, and you have multiple guys collapsing the paint, and it's hard to get out. Um and I think you've seen a few times over the stretch of, you know, the lack of offense production affecting their defense, both schematically, like I said, the opposing team getting out of transition, uh, getting quicker opportunities, but also, you know, maybe a little bit effort mindset wise of, dang it, we missed another bunny. Our, our shots aren't falling. Here we go. And then you just see next thing you know, you know, someone's dropping it three or someone's getting a dunk. And it's just those small moments can add up. So for me, I'm not saying the defense has been good because it, you know, over the stretch, it really hasn't. But I think if they can just honestly make some of like take care of some of the easy stuff, they'll, they'll be much better off. Uh, they'll be much better off. Of, uh, if they keep take some of the easy stuff offensively, I guess, they'll be much better off defensively. Kobe, what's your evaluation of Jamal Mosley in year two? And where have you seen the the biggest change or the biggest growth for him? Uh, I think there's been, you know, more positive than not positive the second year. You know, I think sometimes I like take a step. You know, sometimes it's important to do is take a step back, kind of evaluate everything. And I, you know, I don't say I quote unquote feel for him, um, but it, I almost have to remember everything that affects the team is in like has an effect on how he coaches the team. If that makes sense, right? Um, so what I mean by that is player availability. You know, because of us, the inconsistent player availability, he's had to do more configurations than I'm, I'm sure he would imagine to. Um, because of that, he's had to, you know, probably play lineups longer than he thought he may have or his, the coaching staff maybe thought he may have in different situations. And I know sometimes it can be frustrating because you're like, why is he continuing to use this lineup or these guys? But for me, something something I had on my mind or been having in my mind when we saw this streak on the streak um, when they won what eight out of eight out of ten, you know, I don't think a lot of people would have said a a lineup of Cole Anthony and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people have said this, but I'm not sure people would have said a lineup of Cole Anthony, Terrence Ross, Franz Wagner, Admiral Schofield, and Mo Bamba would have been like this lineup that gave them really good minutes over stretch. And that was a key reason why they're able to get, you know, some of the wins that they did. And, but that lineup may have been a lineup that people complained about earlier, but because they play earlier together, they got minutes together, they able to figure out some sort of kind of new continuity and like get across. If that makes sense. Like people like early in the season, I saw fans like, why is Admiral playing? Why is Kevon Harris playing? And next thing you know, like they're two of the more important players in some, in a lot of these wins. So I think, for me, how I evaluate it, I had to be just like how, how sometimes we have to be patient with some of the players. I think this season we also have to be 
have have similar, maybe not the same, but similar patients with, you know, a second year head coach who's had to deal with this wide variety of, all right, well, you don't have your starting point guard to start the season. All right, five games in, you just lost your, uh, you know, your uh, your starting point guard from last season. Who's so going to be your backup point guard? Yeah, now nah, now nah, he's out. All right, now you lost your starting big man, and then like you still don't have your guards back, and then you're having to use Paulo and Franz in ways that you maybe went to a little like maybe seventy five percent, eighty percent as much as you did in the first place. Reconfigure the offense, you know these kinds of things. And I think overall, the biggest thing that I've been maybe impressed by is just his ability to help keep things together despite the nine game losing streak, because that's a moment where you could like, he could have lost guys. He could have lost players. He could have lost the effort, attentiveness. He could have lost a lot. Um, and I was talking with somebody, someone about this. Someone mentioned this to me, but they took note of how, even during that losing streak, no matter when you see the magic, their energy on the bench is very similar. Uh, and obviously they're not cheering and doing all this when they're down, whatever, but they, they have a very similar demeanor to them, no matter what, a very optimistic demeanor, tr- demeanor to them, no matter what. And that's something I can give, I guess, him and his coaching staff credit for, because that in the long run is going to matter a lot, especially, you know, when you do start off a season five and 20 to be able to have the demeanor to come back with a six game winning streak after a nine game losing streak. And then wait when eight of 10 and get to that level, like that's the kind of stuff that, matters to me from a coaching like a head coaching standpoint what do you think it is about him that has allowed him to like not lose those guys or kind of keep them even keel even through a long losing streak like that i I think there's they know he cares um you you if you're around jamal long enough and this one of the something i've taken note of over the past year plus like the amount of care that he has so i'll give you an example um, after the, so we remember that Chicago win where Jalen knocks down the three, um, the game winning shot. And obviously like Jalen's running to the bag, locker room, everybody's excited. And like, I think like they're grabbing, like everybody's grabbing food. Cause I think that was the back to back. You play Indiana the next night. So guys are grabbing food. Coaches are grabbing food, about to head onto the bus to go to the plane. And just like in a few moments, um, that I saw, chat with Jamal, just him and I, like, we just talked about it and I he, like, he wasn't crying, but I guess so. Like he was a little bit more emotional, just like saying, I'm so proud of these guys, these guys, like they deserve this. Like, I can't reiterate just how proud of I am of these guys and how much they work and how much they do X, Y, and Z. Like I'm so, like, and every time, and even after one of the Boston wins, like you can tell like he, how invested he is in them and this group and how much he cares about them. And I think guys can feel that. I think guys can see that. And I think because of that, like they're, he's able to, he's able to keep that connection um, with them. And you kind of, and something I took note of over the past year, like he has, he's a good, he's good with people. He's he like, if you see him during games, like he'll be, he'll be talking to other players on the other team, depending on the player. And he'll just have like a good relationship with him. And you'll be like, I'm thinking to myself, how do you know this guy so well? You never coached him. You never X, Y, Z, but he's just that kind of guy. And I think that allows him to be good for a younger group like this. In a non-tampering way, you mean? Yeah, in a non-tampering <laughs> way. <laughs> not, not tampering. Oh, uh, I don't hear all the conversation. No, I'm messing with you. Yeah, I'm no. assuming non-tampering. I'm assuming hey, non-tampering. Hey, Luca, just... how, how you doing there? You like Dallas still? You like Dallas? <laughs> well, and th- that's why I said even players he has not coached before. Because it'd be right. like, how do you have this connection with this player who's been in the league, whatever, five, six years, and you never coached? Like, you've been in Orlando and Dallas, and this player has never been in either situation. But... He's just, you know, he's a, he's a good connector. He's, he connects well with people. Um, and I think that's big. And I think, like, he's laid out a pretty, you know, as well of an outline for, I guess, the vision for this team as possible. And obviously, take into account, you're just, I mean, you just keep, you know, guys being eating out as much as they had before, I guess, before Wendell and Gary came back when they did on, um, what was that, the 23rd. I think relationally, too, uh, it helps that this roster is so young in terms of him being able to build relationships as well. Like there, Mose is some is the only NBA coach some of these guys know to this point, right? Like there's not habits they're having to break from you know past NBA coaches and how their expectation or the vision of what they thought you know what they learned in the NBA so far. But you know because you you look at it right, like Mosley is only forty four relatively young there on the side for the, for an NBA coach. So I think that having this young roster has really helped 
him as well uh, in terms of being able to gain the trust of these guys, looking them looking up to him, that sort of thing. Because I think that that definitely exists. And like you said too, Kobe, that, that seems to be the case is he's just a great connector in general. Uh, so you give him even younger players who have a lot of molding needed to happen. Um, he's able to do that. Um, now, I want to also say there's no doubt in my mind and you confirm that for me, talking about how pr- proud he seems of his guys. There's no doubt in my mind, Mosley wants to win. Every, if, if there's a, maybe he knows Kobe that like, I've got, you know, a, a season, you know, I, I've got, I'm allowed to lose games this season. I'm sure he knows and has talked and there's been expectation established. Like, hey, feel free to, you know, run out lineups for development. Um, and, you know, we can say basically this season doesn't, matter too much right in terms of your win-loss record but i know that if mosley looks at his win-loss record you ask him about it hey coach how do you feel that you're all that your magic record as a coach is 35 and 84 he would not be happy about that he wants to win he wants to put wins in the column in that column uh so like i said i don't doubt mosley and and what he wants to do but i want to ask you kobe if you had to say this front office Someone tells them you have to pick one for this year and stick to it. You're developing guys or you're winning games, trying to make the play in. What do you think that this front office says if you ask them that question? Uh, developing guys. I mean, if mm-hmm. you're giving me like, if you're giving me the choice between one of the two, I think yeah. it'll be that one. Uh, and even kind of to your point about, you know, winning games, the, there, I mean, sometimes I think like this gets lost in all of this. Like coaches are competitors, just like players. Um, yeah, you know, losing weighs on coaches, especially a lot of losing. You know, sometimes that's why some coaches may not want to take certain situations. Um, you know, they can kind of foresee this is going to be a losing situation, not because not because the organization isn't good or because the players aren't talented, just because you know. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Steve Clifford saw where this the direction of the team was going, and you know he decided he you know, he decided to. They basically came to a mutual agreement so that, that was going to be the best fit anymore. So, but you can kind of see like, and but you could see where they were going before, regardless of the coach. Like this is going to take a while to get there, and I think there's an understand. There was an understanding of, you know, it's going to take a while to build this team back to a not competitive, but to a play in playoff you know, contender level. Um, so I think, you know, that you focus more on the, you know, something I talked about with multiple people inside the team before the season, you talk about, they focus more on the process of things, you know, yes, the results may come and go, but you trust that if you have, if your process improves, the results will come down the line. Um, and I think you kind of see that with the team, you know, within this, these past two and a half months when their process has been better more often than not, They've had better results, regardless of if it's a win or not. They've had more competitive losses, more competitive games, more competitive wins, um, or just good wins. I think that's more so been the focus. And so tying in the more focus on the process of this season, I think that's why they would focus on development more than anything else. Um, But also, the other side of it is they have decisions to make very, very soon. Like They've made a couple of decisions already about – you know, pick guy picking up whose contracts for the 2023, 2024 season. And, you know, bringing certain guys back over free agency about, you know, structures of the deals and non-guarantees and options, X, Y, and Z. They're going, they have decisions that they're going to make. And I think because of that, maybe you focus more so on development and, and just try to evaluate what you do have in certain guys rather than to say, all right, we're going to take, you know, I guess our more veteran players are more established players who we know are going to get us to the play on playing or playoffs and ride with them all the way. I, I do think there is that factor of let's get us, let's accumulate as much data on this younger team as we can. So when we had to make those harder decisions, we can at least say, all right, we checked this box. We saw this lineup. We saw them in this situation. We saw them in that situation. We've done all these things and we make the decision of, all right, this person may not fit our future plans. This person does fit your future plans, but they're going to have to be on this contract, this role, this, that, and the other. And so I think that's a part of it too, about why they more may focus more so on development in that sense, just because they do have decisions that they're going to have to make in terms of, 
you know, which players are going to be on, you know, this ship, if you want to call it that, going to be on the team, you know, when it's going to be start time to focusing on, you know, playing contention or playoff contention or even uh, greater than that. So, Kobe, Luke and I, obviously, we talked about the fact that we're, you know, kind of depressed with this three game losing skid after you have all this winning, you know, over the course of the last couple of weeks. But it's important to remember that there have been really, really encouraging signs from the Magic, some of the young players on the roster so far to start the season. What has been like the the biggest who surprised you the most or or what aspect about the team has surprised you the most this season? Surprised me. The, I mean, I think the easiest answer is bowl <laughs> um, just because you don't you, you knew the talent you knew the potential but you just don't know how that's going to pan out you, you know when he actually steps on the nba floor and then actually gets to play consistent minutes so i think it's him who surprised me the most in terms of not because i didn't know the talent wasn't there but just because of the the level and honestly the opportunity that he's gotten um just playing more consistently. And I know sometimes it's been up and down in terms of the production, but even the past few games, you know, the points have been there. The scoring has been there. It's been pretty efficient. I think he's been the biggest surprise just because you did. We, I didn't, I knew he was talented. I knew the things he quote unquote could do, but then it's just like, Oh shoot. I'm actually seeing it against <laughs> NBA guys. One. And then two, like he, the, his, he's building off of it, you know, pretty, I would say kind of quickly, like the bowl that we're seeing, in terms of more so offensively and even a little bit defensively, the bowl we're seeing now or we were seeing at the end of December isn't the same bowl who was coming off the bench in late October or mid October. He, he's he, he's developing, even if the production doesn't, you know, jump up dramatically or the efficiency doesn't jump up dramatically. I can see he starts to put things together in what's really his first, you know, his first true crack at being in an NBA rotation. I think him, you know, really, I think it was maybe around the time that when Dell went down, he was playing well before that, but he seemed to like pick it up another level when other guys were kind of missing from the lineup. Apart from Bull, what would you say is like, this is the biggest thing that the Magic can take from the first, you know, 37 games, I think we said it was? The biggest thing? I mean... Can I cheat and do give you two? Of course. Or can I actually give you? All right. Well, you know, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll I'll do. I was about to say as best ask for three, but I think you saw the 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 biggest thing to me, honestly, and it's not. I was going to say Paulo, but it's not even Paulo. Is that Franz is, can take that next step forward in his development? Then, and I, I forget where I said this, but someone asked me. I, uh, they asked me what's going to be the most important thing, or who's the most important player for the Magic this season. And I think a lot of people are saying, thinking, Paolo, I said Franz, just because you saw, you know, he was an elite rookie, and you just want to, like, and I thought for the Magic to get to another level, I thought he had to be the best player to do, uh, for that to be the case. I thought he would, he would have to take another step in his development as a self-creator, as a scorer, as a distributor. And for the most part, it hasn't been always smooth, especially early in the season when, you know, guards were in and out. You know, he, you know, he wasn't perfect in terms of figuring out, you know, initiation or, you know, fighting through smaller guards or just battling those kind of, you know, when they press them, battling those kinds of things. But he's like, he's shown like, I don't, I don't, I used to check this like pretty regularly. I haven't in a while, but after those first few games where his shooting was a little like his outside shooting, she just couldn't buy a shot Like he's been really reliable. And just in terms of efficient scoring inside the paint, efficient scoring on threes, shooting, playmaking, good defense. That's like, and to do that as a second year player, that's, that's incredible. Um, so to me, that's been the biggest thing of just knowing, all right, Franz can not just do more, but he can do more consistently. But like when you get a flash of that last December and last January, when guys were in and out or just guys were just straight out of the lineup to see him do it more consistently, you know, sometimes regardless of context, like, when guards are available, when guards aren't available, that's that's uh, that's significant. That that's a significant development for the Magic and their season, and just what it means to project what the team's going to be. And you feel like, all right, we you may have an idea of what Franz could be. All right, we have an even bigger idea now. We know he can be a financial 
foundational piece we build around him and Paulo, you know, in terms of these, you know, these big wings, these big forwards, these big creators. Yeah, I, that's huge. I think that's great that you mentioned that, right? And and you obviously didn't take the the cop out of just like Paolo has been <laughs> the greatest part of the first 37 games because genuinely Franz, like you said, he struggled at the beginning and then has taken what seems to be yet another leap. You know, once we thought that this guy couldn't surprise us anymore and we said that we were done being surprised by Franz, I've been surprised by Franz. <laughs> if you take a look strictly by the numbers, he is now almost a 20 point per game score. He's at 19.9 points per game. He's shooting 48% from the floor, 34 and a half percent from three on a, one more attempt than last year. I mean, he is just going through the roof in, in terms of what I thought his assist to turnover ratio uh, is good that, you know, essentially he's got what three and a half assists a game right now up from 2.9 last year. What he has been able to do is, is, remarkable and and obviously it's going to play a huge part in the future of this team kobe with that being said we've got what almost half the half the season left the magic see themselves not too far out of the plan but it's still not a small number at this point in terms of games back where do you see this team finishing up at the end of the season yeah before i answer that real quick i did look up the number i want to bring up uh Mm -hmm. So I'll give that before I give my answer. Since November, since November, that was kind of around the time that Franz's shooting starts to turn a corner um, in terms of his three-point shooting. He's averaged 21 points flat, 3.9 rebounds, 3.4 assists, two, 2.1 turnovers on oh, – and I lost it. On – Makes on 49% shooting from the field, 37.9% on threes, on 4.4 attempts on threes, getting to the free throw line five times. And that's like I said, that's from November all the way through December. That's a 30 game sample. That's not insignificant. Like a 30 game sample is pretty, and that's within different contexts. That's when, you know, that's when when Jalen Suggs is playing. That's when Markel is playing. That's when Cole's playing. That's when they're all out. That's when Paul is playing. That's when Paul is not playing. When Dell's playing. When Dell's not playing. That's a lot of different contexts within 30 games. Kind of shows you, wait, like saying it out loud shows you how crazy the season's kind of been in terms of guys being in and out. And like the context, like Franz has been, it was available and started all those games. And regardless, like I said, Jalen, Markel, Cole, Wendell, Apollo have all been in and out for, you know, various amount of games. But that's his, those are his averages through 30 of them. And to me, like that's a second year player. I would even, we're not even talking about defensively where he's at. That is pretty. Like, that's why I say he's – I know Paolo's like, you know, he's the number one pick and he's been great himself, but that is as significant uh, as anything else to me this season in terms of what he's been able to show, uh, especially since November after the shooting came back around. Answer your question more directly uh, now that I got that out the way. If you ask me – I mean, you ask me right now where I think they're going to end up, honestly, probably – I think probably right around where they're at right now. Um if I can just pull up these standings real quick. So I have like 15 tabs open, but somehow ESPN standings is not one of them. <laughs> if you, you know, I think what they're 13 and 24 good three and for, a half games back. Yeah. The plan right now. Good for 13th. I mean, maybe, you know, the, 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 the struggle that I had preseason is the struggle I still have right now is okay. If you're saying that, the Magic are going to make the plan. All right, great. That sounds awesome. Tell me which three teams they're jumping. Because it's not just one team that's the most. It's not two. They have to jump three teams in the standings as of this moment right now. I do think they'll finish ahead of Detroit. And they will. I'm pretty confident saying they probably will finish ahead of Charlotte as well. Um, just I, So I pre, I'm pretty comfortably thinking they're going to be 13th. If you asked me before the season, I thought it was reasonable for them to be 13th or 12th. But you have to tell me three more teams that they're going to jump to get to 10th. And the three teams ahead of them directly right now are Washington, who have a three-game lead on them, uh, Toronto, three-and-a-half games, and then Chicago, three-and-a-half games. So, And I know Chicago was like the big popular one of like, oh, Chicago, like they're free-falling X, Y, and Z. They've, they've started to play a little bit better. You know, they basically played 500 ball um, the past, what, week and a half, two weeks. And the – I could see them essentially doing that. They could finish just below 500 for the rest of the season. And then 
I don't know. Like, and same with Toronto, same with Washington. Like, all these teams above Orlando, they they have a certain level of this season. Like, we need to make the plan. Like, we need to get to this level. And if not, it's a disappointment on us. And we're going to put, unless we make an organizational shift to say, all right, making a plan is not going to be worth it. We see, like, this, this group isn't going to get us not to where we want to be just this season, but beyond. But unless any of those teams make that decision, you can even bring that to Atlanta because they're only a game ahead of Chicago and they're 17 and 19 as of the time we're recording this. Like that's a lot of, not just a lot of ground. It's not, it's not a crazy amount of games to make up, but it's a significant amount, especially when we consider the context of everybody else. Like everybody else has something more immediate. They need more immediate success, immediate gratification this season. At least to me, they do. Um, so that's why I think at the end of the day, the Magic are probably going to finish on the outside. But even within that, they there's a lot of progress that they can make in the 40, what we said, 45 games that they have left. Yeah, I think you get into the last three, four weeks of the season. If the Magic are still somewhere within striking distance and they have reasons to play and compete those last couple of weeks, that's going to be invaluable for a young team. Whether or not you actually end up there, we talked about this at the beginning of the season, yeah, it would be great to make the play-in, but the really the goal was to have a chance to make the play-in at the end of the year. Now, I picked the Magic. I thought they could make the play-in. I also th- thought some of these guys were going to be back a little bit sooner than later. I didn't think we were going to miss Jalen Suggs all this time and Wendell and, and Cole Anthony. Maybe I should have assumed that to be the case. But uh, yeah, my last question, Kobe, I want to start perhaps a little bit of drama here. I'm going to two players and you tell me who you would rather have for the rest of their career. Franz Wagner, Scotty Barnes. Let's hear it. Oh, come on. <laughs> yup. Yup. I want to hear it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Evan Mobley. How's that make you feel? No. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> it's uh, not a bad choice. Yeah, no, people, well, it, he came to my mind because people, like, I see it online, people argue, no, Scott is the best in the draft, or his class, no, Jalen, no, Franz is like, did y'all not see what Evan Mobley been doing the past year and a half? Yeah. <laughs> like, I think he's still number one, at least in my eyes, but um, I, I'd say, and I don't think this is just because of the proximity to Franz, I think, I, I'm not gonna, I did vote Scotty rookie of the year last year, Um I, I know I, I was between my, I think my ballot honestly was Scotty, Evan and Franz. Um, so that's, I, that's the correct take, by the way, I, I'll give you credit. I do think Franz belonged in that final three over Kate Cunningham. So I've gotten everything that I need from this conversation already, but I would still <laughs> love to hear the rest of your answer. Yeah, no, I just think what you've seen, you know, you, what you've seen Franz develop too, especially these last, um, the last several weeks, like I said, the past 30 games, 30 plus games is just this level of creation, this level of just being able to get into the paint almost at will. It's, it's so, it's so it's special. And I, it's, it's, I think defensively, I think Franz is a little bit ahead of Scotty in that department. Now I do think Scotty's his playmaking is passing. I think he's a little ahead of Franz in that, in that department. Um, But I'll take Franz's shooting. I'll take his ability to get into the paint almost uh, you know, pretty consistently, pretty regularly. And I think a little bit better defense. Now he may not have the he, him is weird because him and Scotty are similar, like what's so, like I think Franz is a little taller, but so I think Scotty has maybe he's a little um he's a little stronger. So you think defensively, like they're almost they can place, they can guard some of the they guard similar guys sometimes, but you may think Scotty's a little bit more versatile in that sense, but I do think Franz is just better defensively right now. So that's why I would take Franz right now. Um, but the weird thing is, you asked me at the end of last season, I say, uh, probably Scotty. But I think with the with the tough thing, not maybe not tough. Um, the interesting thing with Franz is we've seen him in so many different contexts uh, over the past, what, 16 months? If my math is correct, 16, 17 months, something like that. Um, and I guess we've seen Scotty in some in like in different contexts too, but maybe not as dramatically as Franz. So I, I do wonder how much that plays a part in it too. Just you know, Franz getting a different level of at certain points a different level of freedom 
to, I guess, explore his game. And there are consequences, yes, but on a team ultimately where the development is the development process, these kinds of things are the almost the biggest priority. And then, you know, making the play and making the playoffs not as much. Where Scotty, there's been more pressure on his play in that sense because – you know, the Raptors are a team that made the playoffs last year and they're a team that's trying to make the playoff. I'm assuming still trying to make the playoffs this year. You had another the correct question answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think I think it's great. You know, I just like to troll Raptors fans because we've gotten so much stuff from them over over the last year and a half. The crazy thing for me with France and Scotty is going to get better. Like I know a lot of people, the easy thing to do is, is crap on Scotty Barnes this year. Uh, but the crazy thing for me about Franz is I still think he can get even better at like finishing around the rim. Like how many times, like at least two or three times a game we're like Franz, like you got to make that. And he's just going to continue to get better at that. Kobe, yeah. I wanted to thank you uh, for, for joining the show here. I also wanted to give the uh, Orlando Sentinel a shout out right now for our listeners who may not be subscribed to the Orlando Sentinel right now, right now they have a deal going on where it's $1 for the first six months. You literally are not going to get a better deal than that. And I don't think there's anybody in the game better at what they do than Kobe Price, especially when it comes to the Orlando Magic. Like I said, your your one on ones, especially this year, you've been killing it all year. Your coverage is fantastic. I love your writing. If you guys aren't subscribed to Orlando Sentinel right now, it's a dollar for six months. I promise you have a dollar. I promise <laughs> digging your couch cushions, whatever it is, borrow from your mom. One dollar for the Orlando Sentinel. Help our boy Kobe out. Kobe, uh, where can everyone find you on on social media if they want to give you a follow? Yeah, no, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, K, it's my name, basically. K-H-O-B-I underscore Price, P-R-I-C-E. Follow me on Twitter. And to your point, first off, appreciate, uh, Jonathan, appreciate the shout-out for the Atlanta Sentinel right there. So, and it's important. That's very important because that's – you're going to get a lot more quality in terms of not, knowledge, insight, information, reporting – through my actual writing. Like, yes, I may say something on Twitter. I may tweet something out or put something on social media, may say something in a video, but my actual writing is where you'll find the most detailed uh, reporting, you know, breakdowns, whether it's what guys are doing well, what guys aren't doing well, um, what, you know, that window. Like, I think, and I did this, I think, the most with the window story that I was referenced earlier. Like, that's where you could see it was a very extended conversation we had with one another. And you can hear him, you can read him explain, like, you know, why he's been out for so long. I'm sure a lot of people were wondering, like, why has he been out for over a month because of this foot thing or about a month because of this foot thing? But you can hear, like, he explained it really well in the story. I'm, I can't say word for word right now everything he said, but he explained, like, it felt like walking on glass. You know, I thought I was going to be back in a week or two, but just didn't progress in the way I thought and all these things. But those are the kinds of things you can find out or read about. So when you ask me, why has Wendell been out this long after you, like, when you reply to my story asking that, <laughs> if you're subscribed, just go to the story, click. Scroll through. It'll be right. It'll Kobe be right there. You. I he doesn't you. mean me. He means no, no. Let's, uh, yeah, I, let's yeah, make that let me clear. Say, yeah, yeah. So what I mean, see, you're right. I don't mean you specifically. I mean y'all. <laughs> so yeah, and y'all know who y'all are when you when you reply <laughs> to my story asking questions that the answers are in the, are story. In the, story. In the article. Yeah. So yes, thank you, Jonathan, for saying that. Yes, y'all need to like. And, or when they like, take a, a a a quote from like your headline and then try to expand upon that without the rest of the context that's in the article, it's like. Go read. You're going to be a, a better, more knowledgeable Magic fan for following Kobe and for being subscribed to the Orlando Sentinel and following all his stuff. Appreciate that. No, I really do. This is uh, appreciate y'all too. You guys do great. I listen to you guys regularly. You guys have great conversations. Oh, thanks, Kobe. Like, it's, right. it's now, like I said, I know you guys uh, live and die a little bit harder, much harder. Back. <laughs> Kobe probably hears us like moaning and groaning through an episode, and he's like, "These dudes." Yeah, <laughs> like, for real. <laughs> oh my gosh yes it's a uh, gift and a curse you know no, like i said i don't blame you like i said i i understand and honestly i appreciate it because sometimes i need you know i'm maybe and even this is my my thing i'm maybe more level-headed generally uh but i need to hear the perspective sometimes i really do just like what's bothering you or what's making you happy like some you guys may know something that i don't i only have two eyes and that's the thing that i understand i only have two eyes and two ears so the more i can accumulate you know knowledge or perspective from others uh, that's helpful for me. So I appreciate y'all for what y'all do too. We joked about it on Twitter, but it's it's pretty crazy 
All we wanted to, all we had to do this whole time was just ask the players, like what, when, when are these guys coming back? Just ask them, and then we get a pretty good idea of that. So, yeah, uh, but yeah, Kobe, the, appreciate everything. And to that point, because I know some people are going to be like, well, just ask everybody. Like some guys are also more, like they're more like they do take their time in terms of like they may not know or they may not, uh, they may not be as maybe not forced comes not the right word, but they may see it more fluidly. I'll give you an example. Something that I did not report. Something I did not mention. We're or breaking anything. news. <laughs> but that same day, I, I, I don't, let me take let me not take that back because I don't remember if it was the same day. But that same road trip, um, it was actually a very eventful road trip if you think about it because that was the road trip where I did the Wendell story. Uh, and Chuma he had surgery during that road trip. But during that same road trip, I asked Gary about how he was feeling too. Um, and obviously Gary and Wendell, they came back on the same day. I asked him how he did. I asked him the same thing. Like, do you have an idea of when you were trying to come back by? And Gary told me like, I'm not, you know, I'm not looking at it like that. He told me something similar when he had the, uh, the knee surgery. Um, he told me at the time when coming back from the hamstring, like, I don't have an exact day. I'm just kind of taking it day by day. And we kind of, we'll just see, but I feel good. I'm on the floor. I'm doing stuff. And I think through these conversations, I found out that Wendell was doing those live those live sessions with coaches and the end of bench guys, Gary was in those as well. So they were based off what I'm understanding is like they did them. They were part of them together, but I had this conversation with Gary. I don't report anything, but that like he's like some players just, they may, they may not look at it. It's like, I need to get back on this day. I'm trying to aim for this day. Some guys may see it more fluidly. So I were in respecting that of them too, because not every guy's going to be like, Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm trying to come back in this time frame. Some guys may be more like, you know, I had to listen to my body um, just because, you know, just being like Wendell told me in late November that he's trying to come back by, you know, and like with one to two weeks and that didn't pan out. But he still felt comfortable enough saying that he would he'd be back by he was targeting Friday or that whatever. Uh, not this past Friday, but uh, the previous Friday. So this is the nuances that I bring to you guys to explain that I almost feel like this is like venting for me too, like therapeutic to get off my chest. So. <laughs> Good. Appreciate y'all for for listening through this rambling. Well, we try because, you know, our goal is to help make Magic fans more knowledgeable and understanding the nuances that we're not always privy to. We know that you are. That's why I text you. And that's why I like to talk to you pregame and bring you on the show (laughs) because we also learn and it makes us better, you know, more knowledgeable Magic fans. Y'all follow Kobe Price. Kobe, thanks for everything, man. A lot of fun. Appreciate y'all. That was our conversation with our good buddy Kobe Price. Thank you, Kobe, to coming, you know, for coming on the show. And it's a dollar, folks. Make sure that you subscribe to the Orlando Sentinel. Luke, what was your your biggest takeaway from our conversation with Kobe? I, I think that just the the insight that that Kobe's able to give. And also it was it's pretty funny to to hear him try to remember all of the dates that he hears. When and, and experiences, whether it's a game, when he was told something, he does a he does does a lot of I'm trying to remember which when this was because the dude just has a whirlwind of a job. Like you, you're you're in so many different places, different times. So that was pretty you know funny to hear that that you know Kobe Kobe has to try to balance all these dates in his head and he does a really great job of it uh, in terms of when a loss happened. He did that at one point. And I was like, how does he remember? When the you know the the loss to the Bucks was up until the win on December twenty third against the Spurs, like he he's got a lot of information stored up there. That's the number one thing that I took away from that. Uh, number two, just his his take on Franz Wagner. I love that in terms of what's been the most surprising or most pivotal. Basically, I can't remember the way you worded the question, but but basically, who's been what's been a surprise? And he said Franz Wagner and his leap that he's taken after struggling early. I love that he brought light to that because, as I also said in the interview with him in that conversation, that the low hanging fruit is Paolo. But he went the Franz route. And I think Franz production wise is very, very close to Paolo and what Paolo has done this year as well. My biggest takeaway was that Franz Wagner is better, better than Scotty Barnes. That's what I wanted to hear. Yes. And uh, he gave us that. So. Mm-hmm. Another shout out that I want to give is to our patrons. So here in the new year, maybe your resolution is, you know what? I want to support the six man show. I want to, I want to help (laughs) those guys do even more than what they're already doing. 
if that for whatever reason is one of your new year's resolutions you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show where we have three or t- three tiers of benefits that you can choose from to help financially support the show and we're getting to ready to roll out another tier of membership so i mean i don't want to say any specific details here but if you like going to orlando magic games you may want to pay mm. attention to the the new tier that we're going to be rolling out here in a couple of weeks so pay attention to that and we also shout out our Hall of Fame tier patrons on every single episode. And I'm going to do that right now. Shout out to Court Cousins, Armin, Carson Tulo, Jonathan Borges, Normal, Magic Player History, Julio Bailey, Gabe Gaines, Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Michael Salapong, Franz, Go to Fasho, The Distract, Mo Bamba, Yo Mamba. Uh, Mo Bamba, Mo Bamba, Yo Mamba. <laughs> it's not Yo Mamba. It's Mo Bamba, Yo Mama. Jonathan, get it together. <laughs> Petition to get producer Kevin on every show. Pierre A, Migzors, Dylan Holden, <laughs> Mr. Mikey, Lil Penny, Eduardo Sanchez, Drum, Danimal, Dodo 15, Bobby Skinner, who hosts the Talking Giants podcast, by the way. Go Big Blue. Goatee 93, Teddy Sylvia, Eric Lopez, Fuchsia, Juan Geraldo, Bill Folden, Edmund Lagone, Jose Squealin, Destined for Greatness, Caleb Pete, Cannibalism, Ty Mr. TV, Chad 3045, Joe Rothfuss, ESPN Really Sucks, Gear 95 Shred, Junior Barus, Half Recon, Shahin177, Himlo, Ban Himro, RM Prof221, and Ray Pastrana. Thank you to all of our Hall of Fame tier patrons and all of our patrons. You can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. Luke, let's look ahead to this week. So on Wednesday, you're p- playing Oklahoma City. Remember, that's going to be mm-hmm. without Franz Wagner, without Kevon Harris, without Admiral Schofield. Then a back-to-back at home Thursday, January 5th versus the Memphis Grizzlies. Both of those games tip off at 7 o'clock. And then Saturday, January 7th, you are on the road to take on the Golden State Warriors. Luke, uh, do you do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Sometimes I feel like maybe you might think that because we're having this competition where you give your prediction and then like I just try to sneak in and like try to beat you. Mm. Do you want me to give me give mine first? Yeah, give yours first. I'm going to say we go one and two this week. I think it's going to be hard to beat Oklahoma City without Franz Wagner. Um, they've been playing pretty well this year. Memphis Grizzlies are the Memphis Grizzlies. Golden State, no Steph Curry, but you're in Golden State. You're playing at the defending champions. You're getting guys back for that game. Mo Wagner is going to be back. I think mm-hmm. everybody is going to get up for that game. You've already beaten them once this year at home. Right. Without Steph Curry, I think you can beat them on the road. I have the Magic going one and two this week. I also have the Magic going one and two, but it's different. We're going to have a tiebreaker come out here. I'm saying that you beat the Thunder. The Thunder coming off a back-to-back. They've got Boston the night before, Tuesday, and then they fly their two-and-a-half-hour flight to Orlando, and I think that the Magic get them in that game, I think it's a bounce back position for Paolo Bancaro as well. Ooh, I me nice. I think that the Magic win that game. What I don't think the Magic do is win either of the next two games, because right now uh, the Warriors, as far as if we look at their schedule, I'm listen Grizzlies. That's an L. Uh, but the debate is the Warriors game, like you said, that you think you know they'll get up for the game. I love that. I hope that's the case. But what I also see scheduling wise is the Warriors play the Pistons Wednesday at home and they don't play again until they play the Magic Saturday at home. And not to mention the Warriors to this point have now won four straight, one of them being against the Grizzlies, the Jazz, and the Trailblazers. So no Steph right now, no problem. So I think the Magic go one and two with the sole win coming on Wednesday against OKC. I respect it. All right, folks, I think that's going to do it for us for this episode. Again, come out Saturday. We're talking about this Golden State game. Come out, see who's right, see if I'm right, see if Luke's right. We're going to be at the Porch South Orange, I guess better known as the Porch Soto. Did not know that. It's at 4757 South Orange Avenue. Their drink menu looks ridiculous. The food menu looks ridiculous. Make sure that you guys come out again. Saturday, January 7th, 8 o'clock, 4757 South Orange Avenue at the Porch Soto. It's going to be a lot of fun. That is going to do it for us for this episode. For Luke Sylvia, this is Jonathan Osborne. You guys have been listening to The Six Man Show. We will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. 
It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Six Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic! Right.